The Gospel this morning from John chapter 20. Hear the word of the Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you, for, yeah, if you, receive, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was the twin, was not with the twelve when Jesus had came. So the other disciples told them, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. (laughs) Brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Here we gather in this room, just after hearing the words from the women at the tomb burst into the room. Well, okay, for us it was Pastor Jim last week who burst into the room (laughs) and burst in declaring, the Lord is risen. risen Very good. I can just imagine the women that day filled with the excitement and enthusiasm just as Pastor Jim was. They burst into this room, throwing open the doors, probably grinning and probably gasping. Surprise, joy, and excitement like that of a child on Easter morning. They are the first to proclaim, we have seen the Lord. And the disciples clearly don't know quite what to do with this news. They hope, of course, that it's true. But as they gather just a week later, they gather again in the same place, and clearly they haven't forgotten the words. They remember the morning, but the mood, the light, the number of people, and the colors are all decisively different. Now, they didn't have the beautiful quilts sewn among them like you all. No, the bright Easter colors have already faded. And more than that, they've completely shifted. They now gather together surrounded by the color of fear. The doors are shut and locked. It seems that in the time in between, they've encountered the authorities and realities of the world. Our gospel says that they sat in fear of the Jews, meaning the religious leaders that put Christ to death on the cross. They fear the same fate as Christ. They sit indeed and gathered together in the color of fear. They too gather amidst a haze of doubt, settled in like a fog as they sit and they ponder. The world has indeed taught them to question good news. Or perhaps the, sea, the news is just overwhelmed by all the bad news. I also note a scent of shame in the air. Those who betrayed him 
are gathered in that room there. So they sit and they gather in this glowing haze and this odor. They sit shut in the room with the doors locked. The pressure is rising, filled full of fear. Now this place, of course, is familiar to us. Our world full of things that we're trained to mistrust. Even preparing for this sermon to preach, for a class assignment, we are told to get out of our office. Don't read it from behind the desk. And we got this assignment in January when I was in Minnesota with classmates. So we did what good seminarians do and walked down the hill to the bar to read our texts for the morning. <laughs> now, I too, sitting there, mirroring the disciples' fear and awareness, I've been trained to sit with my back to a wall facing the doors, right? And that's the type of world we live in, a world full of fear, where ever needing to be aware, safety at stake has taught us to be well aware. The disciples are sitting there probably listening as the doors open and shut, just like me, then reading. I'd have to stop every few verses to look up at the door to see who was coming in and out. Yes, they sat there quietly inside, listening for those who were walking by. And as they sat with those doors shut and thinking about the good news, perhaps an image of Christ came to mind like it did for me. Kyle, if you'd put up, perhaps you've seen this image of Christ before. It's called Christ at Heart's Door by Warner Salmon. It's perhaps one of the most recognizable images of Christ in the 20th century America. You probably recognize it. Now, looking into the piece, it was inspired from a verse in Revelation 3 that says, Listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come into you and eat with you, and you with me. Now, nowhere else in all of Scripture does Jesus knock on the door like the one in this picture. But the provocative question of the piece and the verse is, of course, is will the door be opened? Will we open the door? Or do we sit in the room in fear, listening? Now, you'll notice, as the artist does too, that there's no door handle on the outside of this door. It implies, of course, that we want control. We want to decide who comes in and out and who goes. We try everything in our power to ensure that nothing gets in unless we invite it. Now, we confirm this, of course, with the disciples' actions from the women's words on Easter morning. Just a week later, they gather doors shut. Thomas's words are indicative to the choices that we as the disciples embody. See, it's not merely doubt. No, we will not believe. This phrase packs a punch of pushback. It has a note of defiance that drives deeper than doubt. And as is demonstrated by the disciples, you and me, we just will not open the door. Now, we might welcome him in on Sunday morning, but we don't want him entering into our decisions. We don't want him affecting our political choices. We don't want him guiding our moral compass. And even on Sunday mornings, we all have those excuses. We don't want him to interrupt the playoffs, <laughs> games, matches, or tournaments. If Christ waits for us to open the door, indeed, he won't ever come in. See, it's not that Thomas or the others doubt. It's, a, it's the fact that we emphatically insist that we won't let Christ in. You see, the only way that the disciples and Thomas will come to believe is if Christ enters through the locked doors and brings it right to them. The only way that you or I will come to believe is if Christ comes in completely and intervenes. And that's exactly what Christ does. He comes and he names that this peace is for you. 
he comes and he names that this peace is for you. He enters despite the doors being shut. He enters in whether you're willing or not. He enters in and says, touch, feel, hear, and believe. And when that haze of doubt comes creeping back in and the colors of fear and shame come glowing again, Christ will repeatedly breathe out his spirit and it enters the room and drains it of all fear, shame, and doubt. And it's the one thing now that you can be certain about. Christ's breath is breathed out for you. The Spirit fills this room with joy, peace, and salvation. And with conviction, we cling fast now to the promise and declare now with Thomas, My Lord and my God. This resurrection then resurrects you again to the Easter morning bliss as we proclaim anew, the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.